express uh, special thanks to my colleagues Kent Hughes um, and David Klaus with uh, uh, the Congress on the Hill program for um, uh, um, working with us and coordinating this briefing. Um, before we begin, I think it would be of great benefit to our speakers, um, Ambassador Charlie Glazer, Ruben Zamora, and Margarita Escobar, if we could just quickly go around the room and have people um, introduce um, themselves, just let us know um, for whom you work. Uh, and also, I've had a special request to ask people to please sign in before you leave so we can let you know about future programs. Why don't we start here with this gentleman? Thank you, and I will have the pleasure of introducing our speakers. I'll introduce them in the order um, in which they will be presenting. We've asked everyone to give comments of no more than 10 minutes so that we can invite your questions and have an open exchange. Um, the first speaker is Ruben Zamora, currently a United Nations consultant on democratization in post-conflict situations in Somaliland. Um, uh, Ruben has been, uh, started his political career as a councilman in the city of San Salvador from 1970 to 72. He later served as minister of the presidency between 1989 and 1990, was a member, a deputy in the legislative assembly from 1997 to 2000, and a candidate for president um, for the FMLN in um, 1994 and again in 2000 for the Convergencia Democrática. Um, he's published widely on questions of political parties and democratization um, and uh, has been coming to Washington um, for some 30 years, which is I think how long approximately I've, uh, I've known Ruben. Margarita Escobar um, was just elected in the uh, Feb February legislative elections. January. The January legislative elections as, as a deputy. She will be serving in the Legislative Assembly between 2009 and 2012. She is a career diplomat, most recently was Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of El Salvador, has been Ambassador to the United Nations, Deputy Permanent Representative, Ambassador to Venezuela, um, El Salvador's representative to the Organization of American States, um, et cetera, et cetera. She's worked on a broad range of um, issues having to do with development, security, um, women's issues, human rights, and labor. And um, I'm also pleased that we are joined today by Charles Glazier, who was U.S. Ambassador to El Salvador um, up until just about a month ago. July um, 20th, January 20th at noon. January 20th at noon, there we go. Okay, so he was um, on post um, for a full uh, two years. Um, prior to being appointed um, by President Bush as ambassador, he was president and chief executive officer of C.L. Glazier and Company, an institutional brokerage and investment firm in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, he uh, has served as senior president and director of Jeffries and Company, another brokerage firm, um, and uh, also has uh, served in the U.S. Army between 1965 and 1967 in um, South Korea. He has a bachelor's degree in finance from the University of Virginia and is also a former member of the university's board advise of advisors, and he was appointed as a public member um, of the board of trustees of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in 2004. Charlie, thank you for being with us. Ruben. Okay. <coughs> Would you pay me the five minutes? Right. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for being in this meeting. For me, it's a big pleasure to be again doing something that usually I did a lot during the 70s, when the war was going on in El Salvador. For some years, I was uh, trying to do some lobbying here in both houses of the Congress. Right. Anyway, um, I think that uh, 
the prospect of demo, a democratic development in El Salvador in the following years will depend to a greater extent of the result of what is going to happen next month, the presidential election. In a very broad overview, we can say that the country politically, the war, period of the war started in 72, when Napoleon Duarte and the opposition won the election, and it was absolutely clear that the fraud by the military government destroyed that possibility. And the, the, the period of the war, politically speaking, for me ended in 1994, when there was the first elections after the peace agreement and the first election in which all the excluded during the previous 60 years were able to participate in the electoral process. There, we started the trans, properly speaking, the transition to a democratic society in El Salvador that had been going on <coughs> now by around 16 years. And it seems to me that now this present electoral campaign and the elections could mark the end of the transition of, to democracy in El Salvador because one of the fundamental tests that still the Salvadorian democracy has to withstand is it is able to absorb the possibility of alternancy in the exercise of power. El Salvador is more presidentialist than even the United States in that sense. Okay, then for me the two main questions that we can try to discuss today is that first, if it is possible to make in concrete terms the alternancy a reality in El Salvador, yes or not? And the second question depends on the first in the sense that if there is an alternancy, what are the chances that this alternancy is not going to end in disaster or in something that is not good for the democratic consolidation in El Salvador? <coughs> Let's analyze the possibilities of an electoral alternancy in El Salvador. If if we look at the opinion polls in El Salvador in this period, it seems to be that there is a basic agreement among the, all of them. There are something like five or six opinion, opinion polls being done, right? That in El Salvador, the presidential election is going to be won by the FMLN, the ex-guerrilla movement, and its candidate, Mauricio Funes. There is only one uh, opinion poll that uh, has been uh, saying that there is a technical tie between the two candidates, but given 2% advantage to the FMLN candidate. But all the others, including the TV that is quite conservative in El Salvador, the, com the main uh, TV stations, the Catholic University, other universities, all of them that have been doing opinion polls agree or reflect the idea that the FMLN is going to win the election. The margins vary between 7% to 15 and even more percent, but all of them are in that. Right. But going beyond the polls, we have in El Salvador last month a congressional and municipal elections. Every 15 years in El Salvador, the time for congressional, municipal, and presidential election coincide. And always that has happened, we have had the elections the same day, all the elections. This is the first time that the two elections, the presidential election and the congressional and municipal election, were separated by a gap of two months. To some extent, then, the election last last month, that was a national election, is sort of a rehearsal of what is going to happen. What are the result of that elections, in very briefly? First, the FMLN won a plurality, beating ARENA by, in the congressional side of the election, by around 100,000 vo 100, votes, more than the ARENA party. This is the second time that that happened in El Salvador, that the FMLN has gone more vote in a congressional election. But this is the first time that the FMLN was able to win majority, more, to get more votes in the municipal election. For less than that, 
I mean, around 20,000 more votes than Arena, <laughs> but they were both for the first time winning even more votes in the municipal elections, right? Secondly, <coughs> this clearly put the FMLN on the lead, hmm? but not with the margins that the opinion polls were given to the triumph of the FMLN. This is the first cautions that the rehearsal, no, the legislative municipal election, are telling us, right? Because the margin of the FMLN in the legislative side was 5% more than the arena, and in the municipal election was 1%. Therefore, what we deduct from that is very difficult to do something. The only thing that we can say, look, most of the, of the opinion polls seems not to be in tune what is with the electoral result. But there was another element in the election, and is that the capital city, the local election, the municipal election in the capital city was won by ARENA, by the government party. Mm -hmm. uh, the FMLN had been controlling that municipal council for the la in the last four elections, mm -hmm. I mean 16 years, and now they lost. And ARENA won the capital. And against all the opinion polls that were given again a clear triumph to the FMLN before the election. In that sense, the way I see the, the, um, uh, the elections of the members of Congress and municipal elections is a sort of a warning sign for the FMLN. Because the FMLN, given the, the, what the opinion poll were telling them, thought that they were in a sort of big uh, triumphant parade, yeah? that they were going to win the congressional election and they were going to, to win the presidential election. But it seems to be, no, it's not very clear that. Now then, the question is, could the FMLN win the presidential election? Most of the people tend to think that it's, uh, they are going to win. My personal view is that the most probable is that they win if something is done on the part of the FMLN. And it seems to me that the important three if is one, that the FMLN don't make a serious political mistake in the last part of the campaign, because that could destroy his possibilities. Right? Secondly, that the FMLN will be able to get the people who voted for the, FM, for the PCN and the, the Christian Democratic parties in the congressional elections. Because both the, P, the PCN and the Christian Democrats in the legislature, in the present, previous, in the present legislature, has been voting with ARENA. And now, after the result of the legislative, they have withdrawn their candidates. And then, is the, FML, uh, is the ARENA party able to draw that vote for them? In the case of the PCN, seems to be more probable. In the case of the Christian Democrats, it's not very easy to predict what is going to happen because the tradition of the Christian Democrats against ARENA, that is a sort of tradition in El Salvador, right? In that sense, if, if one hand, ARENA is able to attract that vote, and the FMLN is able at least to neutralize that vote, the FMLN could win. But if those voters go to the FML, to, to vote for ARENA in the in next month, then ARENA is going to win. Yeah. Because the amount of votes that these two parties got in the in the in the legislative elections is much more than the difference of 1,000 votes between ARENA and the FMLN. This is uh, the second point. And the third point that is still is something that we have to see is what happened with what they call the undecided votes. All the, all, all the opinion polls, even a very recent one in December, right, present a common feature. And is that the number of people here that in the opinion poll says that they are going to vote blank. They, are, they, are, they, are, they still don't know when they are, for whom they are going to vote, or that the vote is secret, therefore they don't answer the question, is around 20% of the unit. That is extremely high for a very long campaign, a very polarized campaign between two parties only, 
that is still 20% more or less of people don't say what, how they are going to react. What seems to me that here we can have a similar situation that we had in the first election after the peace in Nicaragua, I mean the election between Daniel Ortega and Violeta Chamorro, that all the opinion polls were giving the triumph to Daniel, but Violeta won. Why? Because the undecided vote moved to support Violeta. They were not really undecided voters, they were hidden voters voter that for any reason they don't want to say for whom they are going to, to vote. If that is true, and the experience of the le legislative and municipal election in the case of San Salvador and other cases tell us that is true, that there are hidden votes in the elections, then nobody knows how they are going to behave. That's why my personal opinion, and I am expressing here, is that although the FMLA has more chances to win the presidential election, by, by no means we can say that they already got it in their pocket. But let's suppose that they win, the last question. Could they govern is the other big question. Because what a government of the FMLA is going to confront is one, a very negative attitude on the part of most and the most important sector of the private enterprise in the country. The problem that those people have is not with the candidate, they have with the party, because they consider the FMLN an anti-system party, and therefore they consider the FMLN an enemy of them. And in the middle of the campaign, one of the most important leaders of the FMLN, Mr. Ramiro, or he was called Ramiro during the war, made a, a, a press re, a, a, an interview in which he said clearly the FMLN is an anti-system party because we want socialists in the country. Very clearly. He said in that interview that the Soviet Union, although they committed a lot of mistakes, is the most just system that ever has existed. He said in that interview that they want a type of socialist similar to Venezuela because it's very similar in their idiosyncrasy with the people. And he said in that interview that this idea of uh, alternancy in the government is a right-wing idea, that they are going to win the election to fulfill the interests of the people and not to prepare for another one to take the, pow the power in four or five years. With all that seen, in the middle of a campaign, you can say, oh my God, the private sector, the reaction is a very negative reaction. This is one thing. The other element that we have to consider is its own party. The FMLN is not a monolithic party. There is a sector inside the FMLN that will go with a sort of social democratic alternative, like Brazil, for instance. Lula. But there is this other sector yeah, around the Communist Party and part of the ex, uh, one of the ex organization of the FMLN that continue to be in a very orthodox, traditional, revolutionary way. And there. How hmm, a president like Mauricio Funes, that do not belong to the party, historically, that has not a fraction inside the party, that has no member of Congress that he has chosen to be now in the, in the assembly, that has no mayor, of all the mayors that the FMLA has won, that will support him, how he's going to deal with that problem. Therefore, the, the, the problem is that in El Salvador, if the left won, will face clearly and immediately a, a problem of governability. The situation of the, of the El Salvador, to some extent, and mutatis mutandis, of course, is very similar to the situation that you are here in the United States with your recent election. Why? Both governments are going to develop their, act their activities in the middle of the most serious economic crisis since the, I don't know, the depression of 1930. 
and that reduce, of course, the possibilities of the United States government to, for instance, to put money and money and money because they could acquire a lot of debt for the future is not the same of El Salvador. That has been close to the limit of uh, international uh, international debt that he, the country could tolerate or the International Monetary Fund will allow them. Right? Both will depend on charismatic figures, more the United States than El Salvador. Both enter to government with a democratic institutional crisis. Here in the United States, because what the uh, previous administration has done with the war on terror in El Salvador, because the, the deterioration of the democratic institutionality of the country has been present, at least in the last 10 years, gradually, but is present there. Both will have very reduced room for maneuver because the crisis that they are facing in economic terms. But the difference are others. Mm -hmm. Obama has a con at least the Congress behind him. And Funes is going to have a Congress against him because by sure the majority of Congress is going to be the elected ARENA, PCN, and PDC members of Congress that are clearly a majority of members. And then he will have to deal with that. What a government could do under those circumstances still is a very, very open question for El Salvador. And that's why my answer on the question, what are the prospects for democracy, is that we could win a very high mark in terms that we have alternance in El Salvador, but that high mark, if the new government don't do serious thing in the first year, and the first thing for me that they have to do is to put all the people together and try to get a common understanding and a common policy to confront the crisis. Right? If they don't do that, the most probable thing is that what we are going to be in deep trouble in the second and onwards for the democratic development of El Salvador. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruben. And Margarita. Yes, thank you, and thank you very much to Thank you, and thank you very much to, to the Wilson Center and all of you for being here this afternoon. Dr. Zamora has uh, presented a view, and I will try not to repeat some of the elements of his presentation for the sake of time. But as you know, El Salvador is going through a cr crucial moment in our democratic process. 1989, President Alfredo Cristiani from Arena Party brought peace to El Salvador, and now El Salvador has transformed itself from war to peace, from a totalitarian regime to a democratic regime, lack of freedom, of, um, to a system of freedoms and liberty and individual rights, from death to human rights, from 69, 68.7% levels of poverty. Now it's been reduced to about 33%, 10% about extreme poverty. The social indexes have improved tremendously, as well as the democratic uh, standards of freedom and individual rights. At the international level, I have some indexes here that I will leave with you regarding corruption, governability, transparency international, Heritage Foundation, World Economic Forum, and others that indicate uh, reporteros sin fronteras about freedom of press, um, a robust uh, civil society, a robust media uh, that has carried on during the last 18 years a system of democratic values and freedoms and improvements in the social aspects as well as liber liberalization of the economy of El Salvador. We have signed a free agreement with, uh, with the U.S. along with the Central American countries, the European Union. We are in the process of associating ourselves with, uh, with uh, a very important and historical agreement of association between the European Union and the Central American countries, as well as with uh, Chile and Mexico and, and, uh, and other countries. The international 
the, Lat the Latin American international political spectrum has shown in many parts of the South American governments and in Central America the rebirth of populist governments, of um, very dangerous ways of confronting a society, hatred of class, changes of uh, constitutions, and some uh, um, indications of intermission in internal affairs through um, this uh, international aspects. Now, the FMLN, as you know, was the former guerrilla movement that has carried its own process. The FMLN was formed by five different fractions, and now, as we all know, and Dr. Zamora indicated, is controlled by the more orthodox part of that movement. They have a candidate, however, to the, to the presidency that doesn't belong to the party. There was a, a journalist, and the candidate to the vice presidency, yes, he's been, he was a combatant, he was a, he's, an, he's a member of the FMLN from the, from the times of the war, and now seeking to be the vice president of El Salvador. On the other hand, uh, Arena, uh, during these last 18 years, has brought all this transformation of the Salvadoran society. Not only change, but a real transformation. We do have a long way to go, both in the democratic process and in the social investment of the country in the development. The international con context in energy, financial crisis, food prices, is now in the middle of this crucial moment for the next election in El Salvador. And it has had an impact. Some members of the political committee of the FMLN have clearly indicated that they are not an alternance. They are an alternative. They have explained that alternance is alternance within the same system. Alternative is a whole different issue. So what's the dilemma for the Salvadorian people? The dilemma is a candidate that doesn't represent a threat, but a party that gives a lot of uncertainty and distrust. Or the Arena Party, who represents 20 years in power, and that has its own its own uh, consequences. If you add to that the international crisis in all of the aspects, El Salvador has been one of the closest friends to the United States in all types of issues. We have not been looking to others. El Salvador has been a trustful and friend, uh, and a strong friend of the U.S. Why? Because we share the values, democracy and freedom, individual rights, progress, justice, social development. But all these formulas are not easy, and they're not instant, especially when you're coming from a totalitarian regime from war and uh, a process that has been very, very difficult to say the least. The strategy for this campaign, the FMLN presented this candidate that doesn't reflect the ideological internal issues of the FMLN. Polls, the polls that indicated for during the whole time they've been on campaign for a year. Mauricio Funes was uh, proclaimed their candidate a year ago, way before the campaign was to start officially. And the strategy has been 
that the candidate and the polls indicated that they were going to win the legislative assembly, the municipalities, and the presidency. They show polls and polls and polls one after the other, indicating from 12 to 18 points or 10 points or whatever of differences between the ARENA party and the FMLN. We went to elections and the result is that at the legislative assembly, the distribution of power is almost the same as it was before. The FMLN passed from 32 deputies to 35. They increased three. ARENA, formerly 34, to 32, we decreased two seats. PCN, formerly 10, now 11, they increase one, conservative party. PDC, Christian Democrats, formerly six, now five, they decrease one. And uh, democratic change, formerly two, now one. So in terms of a general reading, no one, no one by itself has the power to make decisions in Congress. You have to make alliances and negotiate with others. But the majority is a conservative. Conservative, moderate, moderate conservative, um, vote. And I think this is some of the issues Dr. Zamora was addressing to. It would be something that you're gonna have to deal with. It's a Congress, it's not a Congress because we don't have two, uh, two cameras, but let's call it Congress for, for the purposes of. The Salvadorian Congress represents the vote of inclusion to all parties, pluralism, no one has majority, you have to make alliances, but the majority will be and is a moderate vote. A vote that we want to present, preserve our system of democratic and free values. A vote in a majority that would like to, that want to continue uh, the social investments. A vote that it's not an anti-system vote. A vote that says no to totalitarian regimes. And that's the result of the past elections. In terms of the city halls, again, the polls indicated that they presented over and over and over again that they would win. The result, ARENA 123. FMLN by itself, 75. FMLN in coalition with CD, 18. FMLN in coalition with the Christian Democrats, two. FMLN in coalition with Christians and Democratic Change, one. Again, the polls did not reflect the results. Although they got more votes than ever in their history of elections. Along with this, they promoted that there was going to be fraud in El Salvador. And the reaction of the civil society was not accepting that. And the reason is because we had a system that was established by the peace accords in which it's virtually impossible to do fraud in El Salvador. Why? because of the documents we use to go to vote, because of the paper that has inks and signs and, and uh, different security mechanisms in the, in, the, in the ballot that you sign, because we have international observers, because the OAS has been working in the padron, I don't know how to say padron in no, English. In the electoral, the, rules, electoral the, the registry. Registry. Because the OAS has been in custody of that since the day it was closed. 
because we have the European Union for the first time as observers in the elections in El Salvador. Because we had more than 3,000 people from the national uh, organizations displayed all over the country. And because all of the political parties are represented at the tables on the date of the vote on each table across the country. So fraud is not possible in El Salvador, and I will be happy to leave with you um, a document that explains in more detail why fraud is not possible in the Salvadoran electoral system. But perhaps improvements, but that's different. But to say that the system that was created during all these years now is a system that con is conducive to fraud is a stretching it a little bit too far. So at the end, the people spoke. At the end, the polls were not right. At the end, the electoral process guaranteed and respected the will of the people. But now, in 30 days or 32 days, we're going to the election of the president. Yesterday, as I was coming on the plane, I got the papers, one of the most um, important papers in El Salvador. And what we see here is how in the uh, municipal electoral in Pasaquina, Arena won that city hall, formerly in the hands of the FMLN. And our candidate went to Pasaquina, and we found kits being used for political purpose in a very graphic pictures that has really disturbed the Salvadorian society, including the Ombudsman Office. The use of kids for these purposes and this type of signs is something that El Salvador does not deserve. We do not deserve more violence. We do not deserve children being used for that purpose. We do not deserve a change of a democratic regime to an unknown. We do, we do deserve to continue strengthening our democratic system. We do deserve to continue resolving the imperfections of our system. We do deserve to continue more social investment, to continue reducing poverty. We do deserve to include all of us within our political system. And that's the question. Dr. Zamora was explaining that governability will be an issue. Yes. How do you create governability while you are trying to change a democratic and free system and just? I am of the opinion that the Arena Party has presented a very complete program. I will uh, give, give you a copy here for your records and for your, uh, if you want to look at it. It tells you exactly where we are. It tells you how much we have progress. It tells you what needs to be done to continue and how will be done. So I thank you very much for your kind attention. And I think that El Salvador will vote for democracy, freedom, and social justice. Thank you very much, Margarita. Charlie. Thanks very much. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure and honor for me to be here today. Let me, let me start off by saying that uh, I did retire uh, as ambassador on January the 20th, so. Yeah, obviously any remarks I make today are my personal remarks and I don't reflect the opinion of, uh, of the U.S. government, Department of State, or, or anybody like that. Uh, I thought it might be uh, interesting uh, just to talk about the region just for a minute to put this uh, discussion in perspective. Uh, El Salvador 
It's a country about the size of Massachusetts, population of uh, a little under six million. Two and a half million Salvadorans uh, live in the United States. Uh, so it's a, it's a country where being pro-American is a necessity to win an election, unlike most other countries in Latin America. Uh, El Salvador arguably is our closest ally uh, in the hemisphere. The only country that was with us in Iraq until the end of the uh, UN mandate, uh, which was December 31st. Uh, El Salvador earned a great deal of respect in the world community uh, with their participation uh, in Iraq. This is the first candidate since the war uh, that the FMLN has uh, run for president that uh, was not a former uh, guerrilla fighter. Uh, Shafiq Kandel, uh, who was the uh, ideological head of the FMLN, uh, passed away a couple of years ago, and he ran the last two elections. And my guess is probably had he been alive and uh, been running today, he would have been behind in the polls. Uh, Mauricio Funes, uh, a TV uh, journalist, is a very good communicator, uh, and as has been pointed out, uh, not a member of the FMLN party until the day that he had to declare himself a member uh, to run for uh, the presidency. A couple of things uh, have happened in El Salvador that uh, I find uh, disturbing. The first is the number one the number one issue and problem in El Salvador that keeps El Salvador from being the the mecca of Central America is security, public security. Uh, the violence in El Salvador is breathtaking. The murder rate is the highest uh, in the region. But the thing that, that, that I find, quite frankly, the most troubling is looking at a, a recent poll. In August of uh, 2007, 36% of the population put security as the number one issue. Obviously, the economy is the number one issue now everywhere, but it dramatically started dropping from 36% all the way down to 13%. And the reason I find that troubling is because people, in my view, have given up on public security. And they don't, they don't worry about things that they don't uh, feel are being uh, addressed or can be changed. Uh, going uh, to the elections, uh, well, to, no, to continue on just for a minute about the region, there's a lot of talk in Washington about uh, how this administration and the prior administration uh, have ignored uh, Latin America, if you will. Uh, the facts in El Salvador certainly don't bear that out. In, uh, during the Bush administration, uh, President Bush visited El Salvador. Uh, Secretary of State Rice and Powell visited El Salvador. Secretary of Commerce visited El Salvador. Se Secretary of HHS visited twice. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Director Mueller, and there's a half a billion, half a billion dollar Millennium Challenge contract with El Salvador. So uh, I'm not sure what anybody could have done to pay much more attention to El Salvador uh, than we have. Uh, with with uh, uh, candidate Funes running uh, with the FMLN, uh, he has professed publicly uh, to be pro-American. Uh, he has, that's one of his biggest challenges, I believe, is to convince uh, the El Salvadoran population, all of whom have relatives in the United States, that he is pro-American. Uh, his party certainly has a history of being anti-American, uh, going back to September 11th when uh, the leadership of the party was visibly burning uh, the American flag in the streets in the aftermath of the 9-11 uh, attacks. Uh, the FMLN opposed dollarization. Uh, El Salvador has uh, the lowest uh, inflation rate 
in Central America, maybe in the hemisphere, uh, since they became dollarized. Um, and the FMLN opposed CAFTA, which is a Central American free trade agreement. Now, uh, the candidate is trying to convince the population uh, that he supports those various issues, although he would readdress uh, CAFTA and tweak it. I don't know what that means. Uh, the other thing that the uh, FMLN candidate needs to be careful about, uh, Mauricio Funes, part of his campaign strategy for the last six months is that the only way I can lose is if there's fraud because I'm so far ahead in the polls. That's been his campaign strategy. Uh, I don't know how many of you are native Virginians, but when George Allen ran for governor in Virginia, the Secretary of the Commonwealth, a lady named Mary Sue Terry, was ahead of him by 22 points in July, and she lost. So I think that uh, uh, Mr. Funes needs to be careful, especially now when the polls were discredited when the uh, arena candidate won the mayor uh, of San Salvador, which had been held by the FMLN for 12 years. The polls had the FMLN candidate, I, I think as recently as eight weeks prior to the election of being up 13 or 14 points, and I think all the polls pretty much agreed on that. Uh, in the current polls, uh, the history of the current polls for president, uh, they've had uh, Funes up by as much as 17 points, I believe, maybe more in some polls. Uh, a recent uh, poll that's come out uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, has Funes now ahead by, um, let me see exactly what it says. by two points, two, po two and a half points. So the polls, uh, 2.6 points. Um, the, the polls uh, really aren't very helpful because the only poll that counts, obviously, is on election day. But here are some of the, the dichotomies. Uh, party ideology, 38.8% uh, of the population describes themselves as being right-leaning and 34.2% left-leaning. So more people describe themselves as being right-leaning than left-leaning, but the presidential polls uh, show the, the leftist candidate ahead, and when they ask by party, it's the, uh, it's the same thing. 43% um, of the population says they have no interest in politics currently, or very little interest in politics currently. Um, in terms of images, um, uh, Funes has a positive uh, image with 43.7% of the people, which is interesting. I guess you might expect that since he was a TV person. And Avila, the former director of the police, served two terms, is 38%. Uh, the thing that Arena has, has uh, has been, had a very difficult time doing it. I personally don't think they've done a very good job of tying Funes to the uh, uh, ideology of the FMLN. Uh, they haven't convinced the population uh, that he shares our, their ideology. When the campaign first started, uh, whenever he would say something that was more moderate, uh, the leaders of the party would contradict him in the press. If they finally figured out they better stop doing that if they want to win, and I think they've pretty much uh, stopped doing it. The question at the end of the day that everybody's discussed here is if Funas were to win, uh, who would really uh, control the government? Who would really determine what the policies of the government would be? Would it be Funes, who professes to be a moderate, or would it be the ideologues uh, who are the left-wing uh, folks? Uh, I've always thought that it would be interesting uh, for uh, President Saka to put some things before the legislature that would really force the deputados and the parties to uh, show what they really believed in, uh, such as the extension of our forward operating location. We have a, uh, an air base down there which is for, solely for drug interdiction. That, uh, it's very important to the United States. The lease is up in 2010, uh, and President Saka has been asked by, um, 
by us to try to extend the lease, it would make everybody vote to find out where they really stand on that. Uh, we have something called the International Law Enforcement Academy down there, which trains uh, uh, police and prosecutors from all over the hemisphere. Um, and there's been some objection uh, from the FMLN when that was first built there. It's, it's very important to us. So these are the kind of things that, that uh, really need to uh, be flushed out as people make their uh, decisions. One of the things uh, that uh, uh, Kenneth Funes said early on, and I don't know where he stands now, maybe one of my colleagues know, uh, he, he thought that freedom of the press was really a good idea, except he thought it was not a very good idea to be able to criticize the government. And uh, th that was a little uh, uh, chilling, since that seems to be the way our friend uh, Chavez operates. Uh, and just speaking of Chavez, uh, Chavez, uh, I've, I've talked to leaders of most of the Central American countries, and as you might say, um, as you might suspect, uh, Chavez is not quite as attractive to them with oil at $40 a barrel uh, as he was when it was $120 a barrel. One of the things that, to take note of that uh, the policy uh, of the United States in the Millennium Challenge Compact, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, this $460 million compact with El Salvador. It was a big compact uh, with Nicaragua. Uh, when, the, when their election um, turned out to be fraudulent with no international observers, et cetera, the, uh, the United States government canceled their contract. $175 million um, that was left on that contract. So uh, that that's basically uh, concludes my remarks. Uh, I'm happy to take questions, as I'm sure everybody is. Great. Thanks to the panelists. We invite your questions now. Um, if you could remind us once again when you ask a question, um, who, whose office you're, you're with. Anybody? For starters, sure. Go ahead. So that's a, uh, you know, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think it's up to President Saka as to whether uh, it will play out. Uh, if if he wanted it to play out, uh, Arena would introduce legislation uh, for a new lease uh, for the Comalapa FOL. My humble opinion is that I think it would be a, a very important uh, political uh, a move for him to do that, to find out where the FMLN really stands. Uh, President Saka and um, candidate Avila have forcefully said that they're in favor of it. So the only way to find out is to put it to a vote. If they don't, it, if they don't, it won't be. Um, it won't be an issue. If I may, I just add something that we in El Salvador, we are very committed to the fight against um, drugs and international crime and this. And as Ambassador Grace was saying, where violence in El Salvador has been rising, and it has its ups and downs. Uh, now economy has taken the, the concern number one of the people due to the international situation, but uh, we have been working close with the U.S. on these issues. In fact, our candidate is the former director of the National Civil Police. Uh, so uh, this is an issue that I think uh, we are committed to the, to the fight against uh, terrorism, international crime, drugs, etc. The FOL is, is l let me just go back to that for a second. It's, it's, it's really important. The crime in El Salvador is mostly gang related. Mm. And the gangs don't work with the drug dealers on, on a regular basis. They're not integrated into that. Uh, the drug dealers don't trust them. Uh, 
If you look at, for instance, in, in Guatemala, the State Department has a travel warning there because of, of the, the drug violence. If you look at what's going on in Mexico, there's a war on the streets in Mexico over drugs, the drug lords. Um, same thing in Honduras. You know, Nicaragua's a, it's, a, its own deal. That's not the case in El Salvador. It's my opinion that having the, the, the U.S. presence there at the FOL, although it's a non, you know, it's a non-combatant presence, we are there, and we do have aircraft there. That I think that helps uh, inoculate El Salvador from the drug lords. Manta, you mentioned Manta and Ecuador. That's being closed. So under, understand. It's it's important to understand for those of you who don't know what it, a Ford operating location, cooperative security location. Now we fly observation airplanes. Uh, we have um, a, uh, um, a, a drug headquarters up in Coral Gables where they do a lot of the identifying. They send the planes out to spot the drug boats uh, or aircraft, and then we send, or the locals uh, send assets out to intercept, uh, intercept them. And it's extraordinarily effective, and without that, it'll be a super high, not that it's not already, but it'll be more of a super highway coming up to the United States with drugs coming from South America. It's very important. Sure, go ahead. Uh, Chris Griffin with I think that one important thing is to say that the Salvadorian legislative system and the way they behave and the relationship with the political parties is more closer to the European model than to the US model. Right? Mm -hmm. Here, each member of Congress usually is his own mm -hmm. boss. Mm -hmm. And the capacity of the parties to establish a line in Congress is zero. The president has to, could do it, but with a lot of difficulties. Mm? But in El Salvador, it's completely different. I mean, the vote in Congress usually follow the party lines, always. And the fractions are very clearly. They go here, there, and when a member of Congress vote in a different way, appear in the newspapers, right? In that sense, the problem is then that most probable, what we are going to have in El Salvador is a majority of conservative people, right? In the, the three parties. We have to relativize a little bit that because if ARENA lose the elections, my perception is that inside ARENA is going to be a big crisis. And the same thing is will happen if the FMLN lost the election, you know? A big crisis and probably the restructuring of the political party, one way, one or the other, will have to come in the following. What is going to happen with the fraction? I don't know. This is something that we still have to see. Yeah. But what we know now is that in El Salvador, fractions are very cohesive groups and they vote in the way. That means for the president, if he doesn't have majority in Congress, he will have to negotiate with the parties. With the parties, not with the individuals. And that is posed a lot of problems for anybody who wants to do it. That's why one of the things that I see that the FMLN will have to do if they win the elections is to try to establish a national consensus, at least for the first two years of government. In one hand, to lower the attitude of the private sector and the disbelief that they have with the we have with the new government. Secondly, to control his own party. That means that the party will be attached to the agreement, and therefore the president could go to the party and say, "No, no, this we have agreed, all of us." You know and give a measure of governability to the new government that will need it.
the uh, the issue of governance must have to do with the issue of democracy. To implement governance, you have two ways. With democracy, democratic governance, or not. And we see it happening as we speak in other countries in Latin America. So if the conservative wing at the Legislative Assembly is the majority of the Salvadoran vote. Historically, El Salvador has been a very conservative vote. That is not to say extreme right or no. Most of the people of El Salvador are in the center, in the middle. The Arena Party has been moving towards the center more and more and more. And the FMLN, with the introduction of Mauricio Funes as their candidate, but having the second, a former guerrilla, a former combat, combatant, and having the political committee of the FMLN being uh, directed by uh, former, former uh, combatants. combatants, it places a lot of issues on the plate. I don't know what the answer is, but if the FMLN is to win, as Dr. Zamora was saying, he has no one in Congress from his party, no one in the uh, municipalities to support him, a conservative legislative assembly, and a strategy that is based on its time to change. The question is, to what? If Arena Party wins, on the other hand, I don't want to be a Trumpist here, but as the other two candidates withdrew, PCN and the Christian Democrats, now the, the election will be only between these two candidates. It would probably indicate that Arena will win because of the, of the numbers and the distribution of power and the distrust that is generated by, by this contradiction that Ambassador Glazer was addressing to between the candidate and the party. Strong contradictions such as this. I will be uh, a Democrat. And the party will come and say, we are a socialist re party and we will fight for socialism of the 21st century. These contradictions are very, very big between the candidate and the party it represents. And the people is looking at it with a lot of distrust. But on the other hand, the crisis in El Salvador, because of the international financial and food, and et cetera, et cetera, it's an issue that is also there. If Arena wins, what uh, Rodrigo Avila is proposing is a very substantive change. Number one, he will not form a government of political party members. He will form a government of citizens. And that is a very substantial change. That means that the government will not be following a strictly political lines, but it will be responding to social and citizens' needs as this program has been formed. This program is not the result for the very first time in history of political party leaders or members. For the first time in history, ARENA presents a program of government that has been designed by citizens, by uh, groups, by NGOs, by civil society. The parliamentarian group of ARENA has been transformed in more than 50%. I am one of that. I am a result of that transformation. It's the first time I run for anything in El Salvador. Why did I do it? 
because citizens not only have rights, but also responsibilities. One is political participation. So I represent that part of that change towards a more modern way of responding to the challenges of a society within a democratic system. So I think if uh, governance with ARENA is more possible, then it will be for the FMLN. Democratic governance. I, I could jump in with a question. It, it's curious to me that, that not only the FMLN, but also ARENA have stepped outside their ranks to come up with a presidential candidate that would, that would be perceived as having broader appeal among the population. I mean, Rodrigo Avila is not a member of ARENA per se, in the same way that Mauricio Funes is not a member of the FMLN um, per se. Um, that said, I, I'm still not really sure what the election is about. Um, when the two candidates go out and can campaign. Um, is Funes basically saying ARENA has been in government for 20 years, it's time for a change? Um, is Avila saying we've done some good things and we'll perfect them and do them better? I mean, what are the issues that are of concern aside from the obvious, which is, you know, the economy and unemployment? One, so one issue is the FMLN has ALBA in El Salvador, ALBA Petroleos, all over the country. Arena will never get into Alba. Never. Why? Because we simply don't agree with that type of regime. So they are. But the candidate. They have it. They have but it. The they, have it. The they have it already. They the FMLN already. has in place in El Salvador Alba Petroleo, Alba Oils. Arena will never subscribe to that. But their candidate says that he is not in association with ALBA. But the party has ALBA in El Salvador. So what this is all about is very profound and substantive. It's about two different systems. And how much really one person can do if its own party is going in a different direction. Although they have some of them a model of political language in the context of an electoral process. And so what's at stake, it's, it's really a big issue. I don't it's know. two systems. I don't know. I, <laughs> if I could introduce some element into the discussion. Well, uh, let, let's put a, let's make a, dif a clear distinction because between how elites or the directly interested sector see problems and how the whole of the population saw it. Sorry, but ALBA is not a problem for the Salvadorian people. It's not. On the contrary, they offer cheaper oil, and many people are very happy with that. As simple as that. If the U.S. is going to have a facility to combat terrorists, it's not a problem for the Salvadorian people in the sense of perception of the people, right? In that sense, I have been doing the analysis of campaign in El Salvador for years. I haven't been able to do this campaign because I am in Somalia, right? But when I, I took the programs presented by the two main parties, ARENA and FMLN, and the difference is not a substantial difference. It's a difference of emphasis, and it's a difference in the ideological part of each program. When you go to the specific thing that they propose, and not very much, but anyway, they propose something, they are quite similar. And I think this is what we have to understand in El Salvador, yeah? that the difference hmm, are hidden differences, as I will say. The problems if Mauricio Funes is going to govern or not, this is the party, is not a problem for the majority of the population. People don't see that problem. We, analysts, the private sector, right? We see the problem. Hmm? 
And that's why we brought the problem. But for the majority of the people, it's not a problem. Look at the, all the opinion polls. All of them, more confidence in Mauricio Funes and on Avila. All of them saying that he will be a better government than the other one. You know? Why? Because this is the, how these things are projected to the population. Right. Therefore, our analysis sometimes is a little bit different from the popular analysis. And in terms of voting, that is the analysis that we are doing, sometimes it's much more important how the people are thinking in that specific moment or what is the real problem, right? Because not always people perceive, in the long run, people perceive the problems. But in the immediate, most of the people don't perceive that kind of problem that sometimes are a big preoccupation for us. Yeah? And that's why Chavez continued to get a lot of votes. Yeah? Because he's giving this to this to this to this to that. You see? He, he, and, and, and I think we have to take very much into account when analyzing the situation. Otherwise, the problem is that we could make a mistake. A serious mistake with the with the question of the FMLN, and the FMLN has a strain of populism. That's why they are very close to to, to Chavez in their thinking, because they are in a very difficult position. They subscribe to an ideology that is an ideology that lost his material support when the socialist camp disappear, right? They have not renounced to that ideology. But the support of that ideology doesn't exist. And then in Latin America, some, the tendency in those cases is to go for populism, alternative. The main danger of the FMLN for me in a government is not that they are going to do socialism. They can't, come on. There are no conditions to do that. And even the most orthodox of them say, okay, now the, the, the task is to do democracy, but we believe in socialism and we are going to do socialism in 10 or 20 years, they say. But this is clearly what even the most orthodox people are saying, right? But then what they are going to, to really to offer populist measure. And this is very dangerous. Because in the moment of crisis, first you don't have the money to do that, right? And then you could start to commit mis serious mistakes in running the whole economy of the country. I think that what the FMLN, what government of the FMLN is posing us is a new set of problems hmm, that we, we will have to deal with Salvadorian if they win the election, but not the traditional problem that sometimes we fall into that, that oh, those people are socialists and we are capitalists and therefore it's impossible. That's at least my perception. Uh, we're, Charlie, one, one, just one second, though. We're technically out of time, and I want to respect the uh, the schedules of very busy people here on Capitol Hill. Ask if there's, before giving each of the panelists one moment to give a, a final word, ask if there are any other questions uh, around the table. Okay, if not, Charlie, please. Yeah, I just, uh, I'll be I just want to comment uh, on the last one, and, and that's basically, I think that people in El Salvador have to decide whether ARENA has been so bad uh, for them that they're going to vote for Funes not knowing what the policies are, who the people in government are going to be, or who's going to be calling the shots. I, I think it just boils down to that because uh, unlike this country where we change governments as we just had, we have a lot of people in our government who served in the White House under other administrations. The FMLN doesn't have that. Uh, so nobody knows what that government will look like or how they're governed. So I'll just leave it there. Well, <clears throat> no, what it seems to me is that at least my fundamental point is that first, no matter who, who of the two wins, both have been with a discourse of change, right? Both of them. And, but change poses different problems for an ARENA government and for an FMLN government. 
and therefore different responses on the part of the international community, and especially the United States government that plays so important role in Salvadorian affairs. No, no doubt about that, for good or bad, but that is the reality. Therefore, what seems to me is absolutely necessary is to try to devise not only what they are going to do, what Rodrigo Avila is going to do if he wins the, the election. More of the same, more of the same, probably no problem of governability in the, in the immediate future, but the situation is going to continue to deteriorate. And he's offering change. And he's going to be asked for change. Is he going to be able to do so? In El Salvador, when all the previous president, after Cristiani, the, went to the government offering change, and three or four months after that, they knew that they couldn't do it, quite frankly, right? Therefore, this is one problematic. The other will have a different problematic. But this is the problematic of change. How much change could they introduce? Could they go for a complete change of the tax system in El Salvador that is horrible? or just to try to mo move the margins of fraud in the or evasion in the taxes. For instance, this is the ba basic question <coughs> that they will have to face. And that's for me means call for a different answer on the part of the United States government if they want to contribute to a democratic development. There is a common ground. If both government moves toward democratic measures, it's okay, because this is the, point, the common point. The problem is more on the social and economic policies that has to be implemented. Margarita. Yes, I want to thank your, your interest in El Salvador's uh, political process and electoral process. Uh, second, uh, the, the government, the, the programs for both parties are very different. For example, that the FMLN says that they will establish um, a constitutional, democratic, and social state. We indicate that we will continue on a represented Republican and democratic system as our constitution as it is now establishes. That is a big change. Third, this program has been technically supported. This was not. The bottom line is we, it's not easy to govern a country that has been moving only in 18 years from war to peace, from totalitarian regime to democracy, to freedom of the press, from, from repression to freedom of the press, to the persecution of civil society, to one that it has, that is now very robust and outspoken, and freedom of expression. It's not easy to eradicate poverty from 68% to 33 or to 30. It's not easy to, it's not easy to guarantee um, the respect of law. But only in 18 years, we have been able to transform El Salvador. The big conductor has been Arena, but the big protagonistic has been the people of El Salvador, the civil society. So the challenge is whether we continue this. The problem is that we don't have an alternative for a democratic alternance that is guaranteed. We have a lot of distrust. It's not like in the US. You set examples. We look very close to the US. We've seen what your internal political process has been. And frankly, you're able, your democracy is robust. And that is the type of democracy that we're seeking to have. But that and until the orthodox, revolutionary, socialists of the 21st century continue to be in the, in the system, a lot of risk is at stake. I want to thank you very, very much. Uh, Rodrigo Avila does have control over the party. That's a major, major difference. Major difference. 
he has been able to change, and I repeat because it's important, to change the candidates to the Legislative Assembly, introducing new blood, new citizens, people that have never been in politics. One, two, has led the people to do their pro his program of government, and three, he's inviting the citizens and civil society to conform uh, a government of his team. Last but not the least, people perceive Arena Party to be most qualified to govern El Salvador. Although people also perceive that Mauricio Funes is bringing this hope. So it's a lot of confusion, I think, of the Salvadoran electorate. But it's when it's asked who is best qualified to government, is Arena Party that comes into, into place. Thank you very much for your kind attendance, and we're very willing to come back after the elections and see what happens. Thank you.